Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech, and I'm going to be talking today about the current trigger rules for competitive play. Now, just as a quick reminder, I'm not a judge. I have passed the Rule Advisor quiz, and I used to be a judge, but I am not here to explain exactly how it works. Just go over the basics and what the problems with it are and some possible solutions. So let's jump in by actually looking at the rule. First, the rule basically states that players are expected to remember their own triggered abilities and that if you intentionally ignore a triggered ability, that's cheating. And I'm 100% behind that. And at the competitive and professional levels, players are not required to point out the existence of triggered abilities they do not control. 100% behind that also. If it's somebody else's, they are responsible for pointing it out, but I shouldn't have to remind someone else to flip their werewolf and attack me with it for lethal or to do damage to me at the beginning of each upkeep. Though they may do so in a turn if they wish. So this particular portion is if I want a trigger to happen and my opponent has unintentionally missed it, then I can point it out and make sure that happens. 100% behind that also. Triggered abilities are considered to be forgotten by their controller once they have taken an action past the point where the triggered ability would be expected to resolve. This is where the rule gets a little bit weird, because there are some triggered abilities that appear to be obvious to anybody who would play Magic that for the longest time have just automatically happened that now you must verbally announce those triggers even though they don't say a may or anything on it. Triggered abilities that are forgotten are not considered to go onto the stack. So let's look at the some examples of this and what the basic problems are with it. First, this is an actual example that came out for me in the Pro Tour Qualifier here in Seattle. My opponent was attacking me with a Wayfaring Temple, a Wild Beastmaster, and a Knight. The Wild Beastmaster also had on it a Knightly Valor, so it was a 3-3. So the Wild Beastmaster, whenever he attacks each other creature you control gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the Wild Beastmaster's power. Now, as my opponent was attacking me, I declared no blockers and then went through and took, took eight life in damage. At this point in the game, I was worried about the Wayfaring Temple and the populating on the knight. I had no blockers and nothing I could do about it. Now, if you're thinking, why did I only take 8 damage? My opponent, when attacking, did not announce the Wild Beastmaster's trigger. Let's take a look at the Wild Beastmaster again. Whenever Wild Beastmaster attacks, each other attacking creature will get plus X plus X. And under the current rules, this is a trigger. Although it doesn't say May, you have to announce it to have it happen. I took the 8. I announced my life total. I move, we moved on to the second main phase. And then moved on to my turn. During my turn after I had drawn, my opponent then looked at my life total and figured out that we had different life totals written down. At this point, he calls over a judge. Now, I'm really concerned here because number one, he missed the Wild Beastmaster trigger, did not put it on the stack, but he also missed a second trigger in this case, which is the Wayfaring Temple. Whenever the temple deals combat damage to a player, you populate. And he had a clear knight token in play that he forgot to populate. So he's missed two beneficial triggers. One of them, it appears, was unintentional. And the other one, he may have actually intended to trigger and use the advantage of. When a judge came over, fortunately he was very professional, looked at the situation, 
explain what went on. My opponent was very unhappy that he had missed one trigger, and the judge did not point out the second trigger that he had missed. Now, this example has elements here where, in one case, it should be obvious that he's attacking with the Wild Beastmaster to gain its advantage. And even though there's no representation visually, that trigger seems like it should automatically go on the stack and happen. The other one, the populate, there's a clear visual trigger here that is supposed to happen, which is putting another token into play. He clearly missed that entirely, and that should not happen. The ruling here, though, is that neither of them happened because neither were announced. Second example, which I saw happen again and again and again, was where players would play a stab wound, and their opponent would say something to the effect of, okay, acknowledge that the stab wound was put on a creature, and then move through turns into their draw phase and not take damage. Now, since the stab wound is technically controlled by the player who cast it, and they've let somebody move into their draw phase, something has happened, which is passing priority during the upkeep, and in some of those cases, I saw judges rule that if a player gives an opponent notice, such as telling them, I'm drawing now, draws, and then starts into their main phase, that the person who had played the stab wound missed the opportunity because they have passed priority to do two damage with stab wound. This made players extremely unhappy because this is not optional. They caught this rather early, although usually after draw and while well, somebody was casting a spell during the main phase. And they now have to put in place something that manually tells their opponent to take two life each turn. It seems like the onus should be on the opponent here to take the life as it's attached to their creature, but Stab Wound is controlled by the other player. Third example that I've seen come up, and this happened on the other side of the Pro Tour qualifier. There was a side event with about 50 people playing for a group of four underground seas, and someone attacked with a pair of signal pests. Now, that was the only thing they were attacking with. Their opponent simply said, I declare no blockers. They moved into the second main phase. One player wrote down that they had lost two life, and the defending player did not write down a loss of life. At that point, a judge is called over. And how should a judge deal with this particular situation? Battle tries, cry is clearly a trigger. It is not optional. It's obvious that the person attacked with a pair of signal pests but they did not announce that. Now, I'm not sure how the judge ruled in this particular situation. I've heard examples online of this going both ways, either for or against the attacking player. As the rule is written, this should clearly go against the attacking player, because you have to announce these type of triggers. But it seems like a ridiculous situation that you can miss this when you have clearly intended to attack with the triggers. This has created a series of problems. Number one, under the old system, players basically had to help their opponent by pointing out triggers that they would miss, or they would get a warning, which could add up eventually to a game loss. Under the new system, professional players, or players who know the rules extremely well, end up being the bad guy, pointing out a rule that is counterintuitive to possibly gain an advantage or win. Now at the professional level, I'm fine with that. At the competitive level, a pro tour qualifier, often someone's first big event, this rule is counterintuitive and it really turns players off to competitive play when rules lawyering like this happens. Number two, the rule works the opposite way you think that it would. If you notice this within a reasonable period of time, less than a turn, you've actually still missed the trigger. At the competitive level, it makes sense to go back if possible and try to fix this, especially since the cards are not optional.
last thing is that the rule change here is confusing. Now, I know this has been an argument for several people against changing the rule and updating or clarifying the rule, but rules, competitive rules, should be intuitive and logical, which is why I've taken so long in actually creating this video is that it's easy to rant and it's tough to come up with solutions. And unless I have a solution, I'm not willing to rant over something. Solution number one. If Wizards really wants these to be optional in some way, they should go back and add May to these cards or print cards in the future that have May on them. Wizards has used May in the past and has decided to make these required triggers that actually happen, but the rules now appear to be a May in some situations if someone unintentionally forgets. This can also lead to a pretty significant amount of abuse, although that's covered under cheating. The other solution, though, is to actually, at the competitive level, have an intermediate level in which the rules are set up and designed to support. At the competitive level, there should be a little more leeway in going back and putting these triggers on the stack. I would move this to one turn or some other type of metric where it's easy to reconstruct the situation. Most of the rulings that I saw, it would not be difficult to go back past where somebody had passed priority once or after declaration of blockers and put that trigger back on the stack. I understand that if somebody has cast a significant number of spells and there's no way to reconstruct that we shouldn't be rewinding, but the current rule is too strict at the competitive level, which is really where individuals get introduced to professional play. At the professional level, I'm fine with the rule as it stands, even though it's a little bit counterintuitive, simply because I don't have a better solution for the professional level. This has been Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech looking at the current situation of triggers in competitive play. Also wanted to let you know that we're really close to a hundred subscribers at this point and I'm looking for ideas for the hundred subscriber video. If you have any, please drop me a line here or over at Magic the Seattling on the Facebook group and I would love to hear some ideas for that video.